Part of what China's engaged in is information warfare, that it gets out to all those nations, whether it's in Latin America or Africa or anywhere else, where the Chinese regime has been very busy trying to basically put a variety of nations into debt through their Belt and Road program. How calculating and strategic do you think China is right now compared to U.S.? They'll invest decades of time and effort into one potential asset. We don't understand how ruthless and how focused they are on their own best interests. You heard the whole story about they were pulling out of Afghanistan and here's what we're doing. It's been a waste of time for 20 years because of 9-11. Why have we stayed there? Where do you stand with that? We can't stay there forever. We need to understand that when we leave, the Taliban will take over again. Jihadism turns their attention to China. Chinese are going to respond in a very brutal way, and they're not going to care what the world thinks about that. Can another 9-11 happen with the way we're set up today? There's always some element of a terrorist group out there trying to come up with a new scenario that will beat the defenses that you've currently got in place. We have gotten better at not being reactive. We just have to think, okay, well, what do we do if there's a next event? So, so, you know, I enjoy interviewing former CIA agents, but today is a special one. Michael Baker is a former CIA covert operations officer, president of Diligence LLC, a global intelligence firm, and the host of Black Files Declassified on the Science Channel. With that being said, Mike, thank you for being a guest on Value Team. Sure, of course, man. Thank you very much. So what, what, what made you become a CIA agent? I mean, would you, did you wake up and say, you know what, I want to go be a CIA agent? How did that happen for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was... Uh... I was recruited as a toddler. Uh, I couldn't have been more than four or five. Uh, no, you know what? I, I, I think... Uh, I would actually believe you. They start very early. Yeah. <laughs> they actually, you know what? Um, I actually, long story short, but uh, my daughter was actually uh, one of the first uh, kids that went into the nursery that's located there at, uh, at, at Langley. I was back from overseas just for a brief period of time, needed a place uh, for uh, my uh, fantastic daughter when she was very young to be. And I'll be damned if they hadn't built while I was uh, away. They built a, a child care facility. And I used to joke about it. I used to say that's a great place to spot and recruit, you know, new uh, new candidates. Uh, but um, it's, you know, to, to answer your question, uh, I don't know. I kind of I ended up backing into it a little bit. I wasn't something I had planned on. Um, uh, terminology wise, you're an officer as opposed to an agent. Um, you know, that an agent would be FBI, law enforcement, that sort of thing. Typically, if you're in operations uh, in the CIA, then you're an officer as opposed to referring to it as an agent. So do you just go apply to get the job or is, it a, is there a recruitment process to it? There, uh, it, it depends. Nowadays, it's a lot different. When I was uh, younger and, and you know, uh, it, it was it was more of a recruitment process. So, you know, there was sort of a spotting effort that was involved. I kind of came across the radar, I think, of, of some folks. And, and and it was a happy set of circumstances uh, that came about. Um, and I think they were willing to overlook my dismal uh, GPA from my university days. And, and uh, they looked past that and, and saw maybe I had some some potential in some other areas. And so it worked out well in that regard. But nowadays... Uh, look, it's, I don't want to say it's like any other job application, but they've got an internet site, you know, you can apply online. Um, it's much more open than it ever used to be. And I think that's a good thing, right? Because, you know, they, they need to get out there and look for, for the best and the brightest. Is, is there, by, by the way, it wasn't me, but they. <laughs> so what'd you do before CIA? What, what job did you have before CIA? Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was headed down the path. I, I thought I was going to be, this is going to sound remarkable, but I thought I was going to be a, a broadcast journalist. And um, I had uh, focused on, I'd lived all my life overseas, basically. Uh, as a kid, I came to the U.S. for uh, last year of high school. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I thought uh, I, I did you know, the usual political science, you know, international relations, uh, national security issues and college. I thought that's where, you know, I was going to go and mixed it up with some journalism and thought that seemed like a pretty good path. And, and um, it, it, you know, obviously I took a left turn somewhere. You, you know, you know, when you think about CIA, maybe maybe movies have done this to us. And I've asked this, you know, from other CIA agents, you think about the profile of a CIA agent, you know, foster kid, you know, that doesn't have any attachments to anybody, you know, doesn't, uh, maybe isn't married, doesn't have kids, parents relationship wasn't the best, you know, are those 
criteria that they take into account today or maybe back in your day? Or is that just fictional, what we see and read in movies and books? Yeah, no, it's a good question. You know, frankly, it's, it's a little bit fictional. What do they want? They want, <laughs> they want well-adjusted, stable uh, individuals, confident, um, some self-discipline, uh, common sense. You know, they, they're looking for kind of exactly what you would think, right? Because you're given a great deal of response. But depending on, again, look, the agency is made up of a lot of different career paths, right? There's a lot of different uh, requirements in there. And so it's, it's a very diverse range of, of uh, capabilities and skill sets, everything from finance experts to scientists, engineers. Um, and then you've got, you know, people like me. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting uh, organization because it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot more diverse, both in terms of skill sets required and also just the people than uh, the movies ever make it out to be. So you were there for 17 years. What are some of the craziest assignments you had that you can actually tell us about? Yeah, well, that's, that, that is the problem. You just kind of, your caveat at the end there is, is sort of the, the restriction. Look, I, I've got a very good relationship with the organization, in part because, you know, I keep my yap shut about um, sort of the important things. Um, and one of those is kind of getting too specific. I will say that... Uh, I was in operations and I, I touched on everything from, you know, counterterrorism to counter narcotics during the drug wars to, um, you know, sort of insurgency operations. Um, and there's, um, there's, there's in the operations side of the agency, there is always an opportunity to walk away from something uh, at the end of the day and think to yourself, you know, nobody else is doing this. <laughs> nobody else right now on this planet is engaged in this sort of activity. No, and, and, and that is what kind of keeps you fired up because, you know, those moments can be separated by pretty great distances. You know, you could spend six weeks sitting in a safe house somewhere waiting for something to, to touch off. Um, and then you've got a moment of, of something really interesting from an operational perspective. And then, you know, you go back to filling out paperwork to explain how you lost some gear and, you know, uh, you know, your expenses. And, uh, you know, it's so it is it's if, if they actually made a feature film about what really goes on, I think it wouldn't necessarily be as exciting as, as a Jason Bourne adventure. It wouldn't be. Yeah. So, you know, I've had I've had a, a Nick McKinley on uh, uh, where he did some work in the past. I've had. Jonah Mendez on, who was the former chief disguise officer who had, you know, the, 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 the head of disguise of, I think, President Bush or somebody else that he she built. And it was believable. I had Peranto on. I had Jane Wolsey on. I had Shabbat from Mossad on. It just, you know, there's a lot of yeah. folks from different uh, spaces that, that I've had on and I've interviewed with. Jonah Mendez said it best. I said, what makes for a great agent? She said, somebody who's extremely driven extremely charismatic, extremely curious, extremely competitive, but doesn't need to celebrate his victories. I thought it was such a unique way of describing a great agent. Would you say that sounds pretty right on what a great agent would be? Yeah, I, her and, and her husband, Tony, who's, who's passed on, great, great people. Um, and and she's super smart. And, and I think she, she, Kind of nailed it there. Yeah, I mean, look, you're not doing it for the money. <laughs> you're not doing it for the salary. Well, what is the salary, Buzz? What is the salary? I don't. You know, know it's 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 uh it's in line with uh, the government uh, services. You know, the GS pay scale. So, which is amazing, right? If you think about it. Uh, look, when I started out, and I started out at a very interesting time in, in sort of agency operations. Um, I believe I was making seventeen thousand and five hundred dollars a year. Now, when I look back on that and I think about what, what we were happy to do for $17,500 a year, yeah, you're not doing it for the salary. You're not doing it for the pay. You're not what doing year it for was it. Yeah, you're not doing it for anybody patting you on the back. What um, year was it, Mike? What year was it when you were making seventeen five? Oh, shit. That was, uh, that was the early 80s, right? Okay. I got started. I was in for almost 20 years. And uh, so, you know, that's... Uh, you know, but but you're happy to do it, right? Because they honestly make you feel by the time you finish up all the training, depending on what you're going to be doing, uh, you know, I was ready to walk in front of a bus for, you know, the director and, and uh, the president. So, um, but you do 
uh, if you're doing it for the right reasons, it's not because you're looking to, uh, you know, get that constant reassurement or constant pat on the back, right? You're clearly aware that you're doing it for something bigger than that. And, and that's uh, honestly, yeah, that's, those are the folks that I always worked with and ran across and met and dealt with, whether they were my, my uh, superiors or, or, you know, colleagues. I mean, to do CIA, the job of a CIA agent is one of the requirements for them to help you become a CIA, investigate to see if you love America. Is there got to be a, like a certain level of patriotism to be an agent or not really? Uh, yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> I would I would like to think that's the case. And I would like to think that that shines out. Look, it's um, part of it. Part of it is, is a bit of a self-selecting process, right? Um, you know, if you're applying to the agency, then theoretically, um, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of already in that camp, right? Unless there's, there's something else going on that's, that's somewhat unusual. So, yeah, I think patriotism is an important part of it. You have, and, and, and again, I, I was one of those people who uh, never really, I, I, you know, I never imagined myself to have all the information that the the uh, the head shed or the top floor, you know, the seventh floor has, and and, uh, and so I never was one of those people that would sit around and question uh, tasking or you know uh, operational assignments, and and uh, I think that's a useful thing because you don't have all the detail, you don't have all the information, you're a tiny little part of the of the machine when you're out in the field working, whether it's in paramilitary operations or it's in, in you know, uh, narcotics, carnal narcotics or, or terrorism operations, you're just a small piece of the action, right? And all that, that you're doing is getting put in the same pot as information coming from a variety of other sources or, or uh, you know, and, and, and then people that are paid to make those decisions, take all that and, and figure it out. But I, you know, so maybe I approached it from a fairly simple perspective. I don't know. When you got in, were you somebody who did love America? Were you, this is the greatest country of all time. Did you come from that mindset? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I you know, I, I uh, to this day, I, you know, this, this is, I've spent a lot of my time in very difficult and, and uh, uh, unusual and challenging environments. And I've seen a lot of uh, bullshit, but um yeah, and uh, this is this is a unique country. And when you say that, though, nowadays people, you know, some folks will roll their eyes and you know they think, oh yeah, what what you know, what a load of horseshit. But I, I've been in some very strange places where people will talk to you, or if you have an opportunity because of what you're doing, you have an opportunity to talk to people. Folks may not believe it here, but overseas in a lot of different parts of the world where there's no opportunity, people still believe that if you come here to the US and you work, you can accomplish just about anything. And it's that opportunity, right? The, the, the potential for opportunity, the potential for equality of opportunity that is part of the magic of this country. I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're sort of losing that here at home uh, for whatever reason, but yeah, it still exists overseas. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's what brought us here. You know, I grew up in Iran and uh, the fantasy was every time somebody would get the, their green card to come to the States, it was a big party. Everybody would celebrate. And you go into U.S., you know, we'd, we'd watch Rocky IV a hundred times. We'd watch <laughs> Gremlins and we'd fas fantasize. I don't care if there is a Gremlin, just put me in America. I'll figure <laughs> out a way to deal with these ghosts. You know, I'll be a ghost buster if I have to. I just want to go to America. It was a uh, a dream of all of ours to come over here to America. But did you see the recent recruitment video of CIA? I don't know if you caught that or not. Have you had a chance to see it? Yeah, I did. I did. What do you think about it? Um, well, there's a lot, there's a lot to, uh, to discuss there. A, I think it's right. I think it's a good idea for the agency to try to shine a, a small light on the, the work of the agency and the intel community in general. Uh, and I know that's what they've been trying to do over the past couple of years. Um, and I think that's, that's good um, to the degree that they, they can and that it doesn't uh, impact you know, sources and methods and all the rest of it. And that's not something they would do. The ad itself, um, 
I think they probably could have field tested it a little bit better. And, and, and by that, what I mean is it's a, it's, it's a much more diverse work environment than people give it credit for. It's not, it's not perfect, but then again, no institution or business or community in America is right. And they, uh, and they realize that and they're always trying to improve. But I think what they should have done is taken some of those folks who don't have cover issues, meaning if you're, if, if you have cover, you're not going to get in one of these ads um, and, and have various folks within the agency talking about the challenges and the excitement and the benefits and the, the career paths available, right? Rather than talking about one individual walking around and saying, look, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not ticking boxes, but then they proceed to tick a bunch of boxes. Um, or they talk about it as if it's me, me, me. And almost in the, by the time they finish, it's almost like, what, have people been assailing you? Have people been, you know, claiming all these things that you say you're not? Like, you, you didn't earn this? You didn't, of course she earned it. She's there, right? The agency doesn't, you know, that, that's, so. Let, let me just play the first 30 uh, seconds if the audience hasn't seen it, just for them to get a glimpse of it, because they're probably saying, what, what commercial are we talking about? Yeah, good I'm point. I'm just gonna play the first 30 seconds. When I was 17, I quoted Zora Neale Hurston's How It Feels to Be Colored Me in my college application essay. The line that spoke to me stated simply, I am not tragically colored. There is no sorrow damned up in my soul nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. At 17, I had no idea what life would bring, but Zora's sentiment articulated so beautifully how I felt as a daughter of immigrants then and now. Nothing about me was or is tragic. I am perfectly made. I can wax eloquent on complex legal issues in English while also belting Guayaquil. De I still wouldn't think this is a CIA no. commercial. No. I'm still curious what commercial is this? crying toddler with the other. I am a woman of color. I am a mom. I am a cisgender mother. Still don't know. I did not sneak into CIA. Now I know. Now you know. Is not the result of a fluke or slip through the cracks. I earned my way in, and I earned my way up the ranks of this organization. I am educated, qualified, and competent. And sometimes I struggle. I struggle feeling like I could do more, be more to my two sons. And I struggle leaving the office when I feel there's so much more to do. I used to struggle with imposter syndrome, but at 36, I refuse. Is this a challenge the CIA is having where they have to make a video like this to show that they're diverse and inclusive? No, I think this is just a uh, this is just emblematic of the times that we currently live in, right? I mean, I think that I think they're doing the same thing that you know, in a way that Coca Cola did by you know uh, chastising ML MLB or or you know uh, the All Star Game, or I, I just think it's it's sort of a knee jerk reaction in a way, you know. And again, not not denigrating. Look, she's you know full marks to her. She's you know she's. Uh, in there and she's working and so she's clearly smart capable all those things right it just sounds like from the ad that like i don't think anybody's walking around saying she's occupying space she's not supposed to or or you know claiming all these things it just it just sounds it sounds very defensive and it also sounds a little bit too meist right rather than this is a team this is an organization that works together like and when it works together and in, in in the right fashion it is an, an amazing thing of beauty from an operational perspective. Um, so it almost looks like the complete opposite of what Jonah Mendes talked about. Jonah Mendes talked about when you do a, when you become a CIA agent, it's about being ambitious, driven, competitive, smart, intellectual, charis charismatic, all this stuff, but you don't need the recognition versus here. It's more like, look at me. It's about me. Look how great. I Again, I thought maybe they're doing this because there's some internal challenges going on with the CIA where you know, not enough Latinas, not, not, not enough women, not enough African-Americans. But I would assume that in the CIA, you almost have to recruit folks from different nationalities and ethnicities, because if you're going into different markets, you need to kind of blend in. I remember one time my dad comes yeah. up to me and uh, we have someone in our family that used to be part of the MI6. And eventually we found out years later. And it's funny because uh, that person took the same route as you, journalistic, you know, they went through the media route and a boom, they got picked up. Sometimes that's pretty common. My dad says, hey, you, you can tell me, you, you can tell me. I said, what's that, dad? Tell me, it's okay, I, I, I know, I already know at this point. I said, dad, honestly, I swear to God, I have no clue what you're talking about. He says, how long have you been with the CIA? I said, you think I'm with the CIA? 
He says, how long have you been with us? He can wink if you are. I said, Dad, I'm not part of this. <laughs> wink if so you are. <laughs> it took him five years to think that his son's part of it. I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm not part of the CIA. Yeah. But he, uh, uh, till today, I think he still has a little bit of a skepticism whether I am or not. But anyways, I see this here. I say, I don't know. I don't know if the ad is, uh... hey, by the way, has CIA always done commercials or no? Have they done no, commercials? No, no, no. It's, I mean, it's not the first one they've done. And, and you know, again, they've got a Twitter page and, and, you know, and I, I get why they're doing it, right? I just, again, I just think it's the wrong path, the wrong marketing message, right? Have, you know, she could have simply by talking about if she, if she had been the same individual and she had just been walking through the hallways talking about the, the challenges, the benefits of working for the agency, right? You're already sending a message by having her deliver that, but you're talking about an organizational effort and a team effort and all those things. So I think the interesting thing about this, this particular ad is, look, they've pissed off both sides, right? They pissed off all the people who are tired of the, of the wokeism and think that it's, it's the wrong path to, to take and it's dividing people. And it's also pissed off, interestingly, all those cats that dig talking about uh, wokeism, you know, and that, that are all woke themselves. And because now what they're complaining about, what they're pissed off about is that the, the CIA has, in their minds, usurped their language, right? Taken their language of wokeism and used it for their own benefit. So somehow that's wrong. So both sides are, are irritated by this. Uh, you know, you could argue that people are talking about it. Uh, and if that's your metric, you know, for success, then, hey, fine. But it, it, it's the CIA, not Pepsi Cola. So I don't think that should be the metric. Yeah. Again, if, if they're trying to target a certain audience, that's what this commercial got. But it mm. didn't get in, instead of doing a little bit more inclusive, it would have been better to. Uh, have everyone be in there, but again, behind closed doors, you don't really know what's taking place. So let me get into my questions. I got a bunch of different topics I want to go through with you sure. that I'm so curious about. One of them is this. Here's a question. Black classify, black files declassified on Science Channel. It's a show that you've been running. Can you give the audience, if they haven't seen an episode, what's the show about? Yeah, it's uh, the first season, Sydney, uh, available on Discovery Plus. It's a Discovery Science Channel uh, production. We're just getting ready in two weeks. We go out and uh, start filming the second season. And the idea behind the show originally was that, um, in a sense, in a very simple way, it was sort of follow the money. If you want to understand interesting operations uh, within the U.S. government, if you want to understand um, clandestine uh, services, activities, uh, special forces operations, whatever it may be, uh, latest research and development in, in warfare, uh, weapons technology, then one of the uh, best ways you can start to identify all that is by following the money, looking at the budgets, because money has to be spent. So it has to sit somewhere in some budget somehow. So that was the basic premise of it. And then it sort of branched out from there to start looking at a variety of, of interesting uh, military and intel community and government operations and activities and organizations and, and people and um, combine all that with some of the latest technology that's being developed uh, for some of those uh, activities and, and just see what we can see. So we travel around the country and, and uh, you know, it's a great opportunity. I, you know, I love meeting people and, 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 and seeing things that otherwise I wouldn't see, having a chance to do things that otherwise I wouldn't have a chance to do. And, and it's, it, it's so anyway, I, I'm subjective. But I think it's the finest show made for television ever. <laughs> I, love, I so. love how humble you are about it. Very necessary. <laughs> But, you know, so episode number one, the secrets of Space Force. Number two, American UFOs. Number three, to catch an alien. Number four, how to stop an assassination. Number five, episode five, Iron Man Army. Six, rise of the Night Stalkers, right? All the very, very interesting episodes. But here's a question for you. So I'll sit down. Buddy of mine was Delta. We were in the Army together at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And I leave. I go into business. He goes and becomes a Delta Force and does great for himself. And I said, so what do you know? What do you do? All this stuff. You know, there's only 800 of us. And, you know, we're the same level as Navy SEAL Team 6. And there's everybody else. But it's us two and blah, 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 all this stuff. Okay, great. Who's above you? We'll report to this. Who's above them? We'll report to them. Okay. So you look at FBI, you look at CIA, you look at DEA, you look at LAPD, any kind of PD, you look at uh, the government, you look at military, you look at politicians. Who is the ultimate puppet master? And what I mean by the ultimate puppet master, because I even think about it, oh, when you become a president, you have the key, you know, you have the key to the nuclear, whatever. I'm like, 
I don't believe that the president is the ultimate decision maker. There's got to be some people who know stuff that nobody else knows that they know stuff and they don't even tell the president. I, 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 I have a very hard time believing that you're going to tell 100% of the intel, all the darkest secrets of a nation of the world that we know about the mistakes that we have the skeletons in the closet, which is probably a ton of them. I don't know if one president that's going to be there for four years or eight years, you'd fully trust. So who is the ultimate power at the top? Well, it's it's uh, actually it's kind of divided if you're thinking about in terms of who's got all the information. So nobody really has all the information uh, and nobody really wants all the information when it comes to um a military element or uh, an intelligence community activity, whatever it may be, because it's just, it's too much. You're not going to burden, you're right, you're not going to burden the president with all that detail. Uh, you know, so typically a president, if you're looking, uh, you know, like the bin Laden, right, you present options, right? Here are, are the three options. And you present sort of a high level analysis as to why they have been selected as scenarios that he should now have to choose from. And you know, all that includes risk versus gain calculations and all the rest of it. But in terms of just, you know, specifics, um, you know, there's no one repository. There's no one book of secrets that exists that has everything. And there's no one, you know, as George Bush used to say, no one decider. Right. I mean, there is in the sense that the president will, you know, give a yay or nay on something, perhaps. But it's not as if he's doing that because he has read into everything. Nobody could nobody could get through that. Yeah, but there's I, like I I I I don't know. I just wonder, you know, how, how much how much uh, time out of your free time that you have did you ever commit to studying secret societies? Did you ever get into the secret society stuff, or not really? Uh, you know what? Not not really. Um, you know, of course, that's exactly what you would say if you were a member of a secret society. <laughs> <laughs> you're qualified. I just want yeah. you to know you're fully qualified. Yeah, I so, uh, yeah, but I'm not, you know what, it's interesting because um, I've had these conversations before um, and people never believe me, I, 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 but I'll say I'm not typically a conspiracy theorist, right? And, and Black Files and Classified, that Discovery Show, is not about uh, conspiracies necessarily. It touches on certain ones, but not really. And the reason I'm not is because I spent a lot of time kind of behind the curtain, you know, watching, you know, I guess how the sausage is made to mix my metaphors. And, and uh, uh, what I came away with is oftentimes life is exactly as simple as it appears to be. And that may be some sort of um, mechanism for dealing with life uh, that I've developed. But I, I always look at things and, I, and I, I tell my folks this all the time. I tell my kids this. I tell the people that work for me in, in you know, Portman Square that you never really have very many options on the decision tree, right? Whether you're out in the middle of nowhere and you've got an operation going on and now you got to figure out what to happen because it's all headed south. And, you know, oddly enough, your plan A and B didn't work. Um, so you never really have a lot of options. I just always, you know, there's very few conspiracies or, you know, uh, ideas that I've, I've seen that, you know, I walked away from and thought, yeah, maybe there is something to that. So, so the secret society thing, I've never, I guess it just never really caught my, my attention too much. Because I, I don't really believe there's a cabal out there who's directing traffic for the entire world. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like uh, uh, the whole story about where the Koch brothers are talking to each other. So which president do you want me to get you for your birthday this year? You know, oh, let's go <laughs> fund this one. And then, you know, on the complete opposite side, it's like, well, look at the stuff that Soros is doing and setting up the bricks for protesters and you know oh my gosh it's soros behind everything and he's funding yeah. these protests and he's funding that one part is for a person to be naive and just say i don't know if that's taking place or not you did a c-span interview years ago mm -hmm. and you said nothing is black and white you said you talk about when you're in many countries your choices aren't between good and evil oftentimes your choices between evil and less evil right so yeah. that the, the evil and less evil as citizens who go about their lives, you're like, oh, man, I just got to go pay the bills. I got to make some money. I got kids. I'm going to try to make this practice here. Hopefully I can make it to the game. I hope my son plays and his coach lets him in and church, 
man, he's trying to really push to raise money for this new building. I hope he doesn't come and want to meet with us to give 10%. I've been doing 2%, you know, marriage. We've been having a lot of fights. My mom is sick. My dad is sick. My brother's going through issues. My friend and I got into a fight. So I'm just trying to figure this whole thing. I don't really have time to think right. what Coke brothers and Soros is doing. <laughs> then you have the weird community. The weird community is the why community that can't stop asking the flipping question, which is why, why, why? You would hope that would stop when you're six, seven, eight years old as a kid. You cannot keep asking that why question at 40 years old, right? Yeah. You, 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 you cannot tell me like there is not some people behind closed doors of power that are making a lot of these decisions. Because if I sit there and I think about, okay, let's, let's go a different angle if you, you know, uh, instead of the secret society, mm -hmm. let's talk China. Okay. Okay. If, if, if we were, uh, uh, the, uh, if America was a human being and China was a human being, there are two people, you know, America's two years old, China's 20 years old. Okay. If America was, uh, you know, 10 years old, America is 100 years old. If America is five years old, China is 50 years old. You know where I'm going yeah, with this. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so America, we're very confident. We're very confident, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of this, freedom of that. But China is also extremely, you know, quiet, calculating, strategic, long-term thinking. They know because of experience of having seen their former rulers and leaders, all the flipping mistakes they've made because they got a few thousand years of case studies, right? right. They have access to exactly. them. their own case studies, right? <laughs> and when you have all these case studies, I don't care what university you go to, it's personal. We yeah. read about it, we know about it, we know our flaws. Okay, so they know the games they're playing. I guess I'll let you tell us a little bit on what, how, how calculating and strategic you think China is right now compared to U.S.? Well, I don't think they're any, it's not that they're any smarter. Um, it's just that they've got a longer view, right? And, and it kind of comes down to what you're talking about in terms of just, you know, we've got the brashness and confidence of youth, meaning we're a young country. Um, they, you know, have walked a very long road, you know, throughout their history. They tend to have a much, much longer uh, view. And that brings patience um, and sometimes brings more attention to detail. So, that gives them an advantage to some degree in that we're always kind of chasing whatever object is out there and it's shiny. And, and, you know, we seem to have a hard time focusing on more than one or two things at a time. But uh, yeah, it's, it's that I would, I would say that is probably the biggest difference between us, not just from a, an intelligence or a operational perspective, but that is also important. They'll invest uh, decades of time and effort into one potential asset. Um, uh, and you know, all without any payoff for perhaps 20 or 25 years. And then suddenly that asset who, you know, actually works for the Chinese, uh, Intel ends up at Raytheon or, or Motorola or, you know, the, the skunk works or wherever it may be. So that, that I think is, is an advantage they have. I don't think we're going to be able to, you know, develop suddenly a longer view, you know, from our perspective. It's an advantage they have. Um, um, as far as uh, 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 being united, even though our country's name is United, <laughs> and you know we are the United States of America, and China, we don't have a clue what's going on over there because you can never tell the debates they're having internally amongst their politicians because that's never public. That's private mm -hmm. to them. It's their business. They don't think it's our business to know what's going on over there. So we're like right. the husband and wife. We're our... Uh, we're, U.S. is more like keeping up the Kardashians and China is more like a very private show that only they know about. Everything yeah. we do is publicized, right? We know every, yeah. uh, the world knows our, our problems, our drama, everything. Yeah, we have, a short, we have a short attention span and we have a, a tendency here in the States to, um, you know, think, I don't want to make this sound too simplistic, but we do uh, tend to, in this country, um, think the best, right, of other nations for the most part, right? We, or maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's just that we imagine that we're all in the same boat together somehow. And we mirror our values or the way that we see ourselves or would like to see ourselves 
onto other nations, right? So that hampers our negotiations sometimes when you're talking about a country like China or Russia, um, you know, the Iranian regime, the North Koreans, because we, you know, we, we don't sometimes seem to understand how ruthless they are and how uh, singularly focused they are on their own best interests. Well, we're not. We're the complete opposite. So yeah. who, who, who can be bought more? Is, is U.S. more for sale or is China more for sale? Well, I think we're more easily distracted uh, in terms of. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, it's phrased very interestingly. Um, Hmm. You know, I think the problem with with uh, with the way that we approach China is that, look, the past four years um, and I, you know, didn't have a dog in the hunt in the, in the past, you know, presidential thing. I, you know, I like so I like Republican policies. I don't necessarily need to like the person who's leading them. Right. Um, but I think we had a, a relatively honest, open discussion about China for the first time in quite some time. Right. Some of the actions that were done, some of the things that were said, um, I think it actually put the Chinese regime on their back foot. They weren't expecting sort of that behavior because for decades we've always approached China in the same way and always expect the same sort of result that somehow they're going to gravitate towards a more democratic society. That's horseshit. You know, as long as Xi's in charge, Xi has set himself up much like much like Putin. Look, Putin's going to be president until he dies, right? And Xi is pretty much done the same thing. And he has completely locked down the security services. Uh, he squashed any hope of any pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, uh, the, the genocide with the Uyghurs. And yet we continue sometimes to act as if, you know, hey, you know, these are people that we can understand and work with and we've got aligned interests. And, you know, maybe once in a generation, our interests actually align. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, you, you see so, so much of the world relying on this one country, China, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's chips. We learned during COVID, we kind of need these guys for pharmaceuticals. You saw what happened with India, 400,000 people a day getting COVID and the officials of China send a tweet essentially on their web, on, a, on their own Twitter website called Weibo, making fun of uh, uh, India, what they're going through versus how, look at us, we took a, you know, a uh, 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 rocket launcher and these guys are blowing up over there and then they took it down because they got heat from their own people that called out the officials in China. And uh, now India desperately needs 1.2 billion vaccines and who's the only place in the world that can get their 1.2 billion vaccines and all the intel, all the negotiations, the trade secrets that they picked up. Is it too late? Meaning uh, yesterday, I think 60 Minutes was done, what, a few days ago with Anthony Belkin? Uh, 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 I'm pronouncing his wrong name wrong. Blinken. Blinken and yeah. the, the lady asked the question saying by 2028, uh, China is uh, poised to be a bigger GDP than U.S., right? Is it is it already, are we at the point of no return where China is going to be the largest empire in the world and it's going to be very hard to compete against those guys? Well, that's the narrative that they push. And, and, and part of what China is engaged in is sort of information warfare, right? So, so they've been beating that drum that, look, it's inevitable. China's heading towards the top of the food chain. Um, you know, the U.S. is a nation in decline. Those things are talking points that the uh, that the Chinese propaganda machine has been pushing out for some time, and they're very good at it. They're very effective at it. We talk about Russian disinformation all the time, but the yeah, you know, the Chinese have far more resource um, than uh, than the Russians do, and they've been very aggressive and active in trying to make sure that. Not just that message gets out here in the U.S., but that it gets out to all those nations, whether it's in Latin America or Africa or anywhere else, where the Chinese regime has been very busy uh, trying to, uh, you know, basically put a variety of nations into debt through their Belt and Road program, uh, lock up as much of the, you know, rare earth mineral commodities as possible. And, 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 other, and, and look, they've got their first overseas port now, you know, sitting in, in uh, Djibouti in Africa. And... Um, that's not by accident, that's by design. They are pushing out their military aggressiveness in a, in a concerning way, a very concerning way. They uh, seem to be kind of accelerating their timetable uh, internally when it comes to their thought process towards Taiwan. Um, so 
is it is it inevitable? Uh, no, not by any means. They've got a lot of problems. They, they've got internally, there's a lot more protest that goes on internally in China than we're aware of. Um, you know, there is corruption that exists within that that uh, that uh, government that, you know, can at any time cause one of their people to topple. Right. So, you know, it's a very it's in a way it's a it's, it's a relatively frail system. And that's why Xi has been so busy trying to lock it down, you know, for his own purposes and, and uh, so? ensure his, his longevity. You believe that you, you believe it's a frail empire where. It well, no, what I mean is, I mean, parts of the parts of the way the organization and look, I mean, frankly, I, you know, I, maybe I'm just stupid and, and old school and, and you know, I, I, but, um, you know, socialism, communism, you know, they. You, China's been around a long time. Communism has not. Right. Communist China has not been around a long time. So when we think of China, you don't you, you, you don't think, okay, well, this system has been around forever. No, it yeah. hasn't. So what I'm saying is there's the, a frailty built into communism and, and socialism that eventually, I believe, uh, outs itself, right, comes out. And, and, and then, you know, we see the decline in whatever nation it happens to be. So uh, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, they, you know, it may not happen, you know, next year, obviously, or the next decade or in our lifetime. But, yeah, I don't hold any water in thinking somehow that China is inevitably the next powerhouse. Yeah. It, it, who, who do you think is afraid of their government more? Is U.S. population, you know, more afraid of their government or is, is, is China citizens more afraid of their government? Well, I don't know if it's a, a fear. Uh, you know, the U.S. population is more skeptical of their government. Um, it's a more it's, it's a, clearly a much more open society. Um, and questioning government is kind of part of the fabric of, of America, you know, and, and being skeptical about your leadership. And, and, you know, we've got that ability and that right, thank God. Uh, China, that's not the case, right? They struggle to just get any details about what's going on in, in, uh, within their government um, or actual news that's related to you know, any internal domestic events or issues. So um, I think uh, the Uyghurs certainly fear the Chinese regime uh, and the, you know, elements of, of pro-democracy in, in Hong Kong that used to exist and are no longer in existence because they've all been banged up and, and thrown in jail for the most part. Um, they certainly fear the Chinese regime. It goes back to what you were saying earlier, though. A lot of the population there is just trying to put food on the table. Right. And, you know, they're still we, we're, we're a little bit softer, right? We don't have to go out and collect water and food every day for the most part. So, um, you know, we have that luxury of questioning everything. How, uh, by the way, that's a great uh, comparison. We're, you know, skeptical Americans versus, you know, a little more afraid about the government, what the government could do to them. And I think it's even the most wealthiest man in uh, China, Jack Ma's afraid because look at them. Hey, they started their series of trying to break the company apart. Hey, you can't mm -hmm. do this. You're thinking you're too powerful. You're the speech you made. You should have never taken a shot at the government. Shame on you. Right. Look how much money you've made because of the government. If it wasn't for the Chinese government, you wouldn't be as rich as you are. So that's that part. How, how much, how deep is the U.S. as far as how infiltrated are we with our CIA agents in the Chinese government? Are, are we getting intel? Uh, you know what? I, I, <laughs> it's going to sound like I'm being coy. I hope so. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure we are, whether it's through our own assets or through, you know, liaison work uh, with other countries. Um, you know, that's kind of gets down to a little bit too close to the bone to sources and methods. But look, uh, people here in, in the States better hope that we are good at it and that we are active because the Chinese uh, regime, the Chinese Intel Service, within the PLA in particular is very aggressive, very, and, and, and not just here, but with all our allies. And they are busy hoovering up every piece of information that they get their hands on on a daily basis, whether that's through cyberspace or through old fashioned human sources, you know, they have an enormously aggressive uh, you know, effort underway around the globe. So yeah, we have to do everything we possibly can to counter that. What, what is, uh, okay, so what, what concerns you the most about them? Is it you know, long term, I mean, you know, I lived in Dallas for five years. So mm -hmm. when I left Dallas, the moment I left Dallas, two weeks later, the storm hit. And this was just, you know, 12 weeks ago, 13 weeks mm -hmm. ago. 
We had to shut down our office. Pipes were blowing up. One of my C-suite executives, bedroom, master bedroom upstairs, living room down here. They were out visiting grandma. The bed fell to first floor oh, because geez. the pipe blew up. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Like a cartoon. Yeah. yeah, it's like a cartoon. And it yeah. was happening everywhere. One day, two days, three days, five days, seven days. We had an mm-hmm. event going at Gaylord, and I'm doing a conference call with Gaylord with my executives at Gaylord. We have, we're expecting 2,000 people there. They're in the hotel room. Lights are off. They have beanies on and four sweaters on because the heater doesn't work at Gaylord. And Gaylord is a well-known right. hotel. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, what if that becomes a formula for somebody who's a little bit more divisive in, the, in Asia, a country called China, saying, wow, what a great, uh, what if we could do that to U.S. for eight weeks? What if we could do that to U.S. for you know, four months? What if we do bio warfare? What if we do cyber? What if we do? Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's already in their playbook. Them. Yeah, it's, that's already in their playbook. They've already figured that out in terms of, you know, what the, the uh, a, a major conflict could look like. And, uh, and, you know, if you get all the, you know, Pentagon and military and Intel community leaders in, in DC and put them in a conference room and you know, ask them all what they spend most of their time worrying about at night, it would be, uh, you know, an attack on the infrastructure here in the U.S., right? That's that's right up there at the top of the list. So that's, and that's something that happens every day, whether it's the Russians or the Chinese or any other nation that's got the resources, they're out there probing and mapping uh, our infrastructure. And that's everything from the power grids to understanding how our, our, our water treatment facilities work, our transportation routes and hubs, uh, the banking system. And, and, and they're not doing it because they're just curious. They're doing it because they're drawing up or have drawn up um, scenarios for how that next major conflict, if it, you know, God forbid should happen, is going to occur. And it's not going to look anything like what, you know, we were used to from the past. And, and you're absolutely right. You look at, you know, look at a place like Austin when they went during that storm. People were losing their minds, right? And it was, you know, three days of power. Look, I used to live in Connecticut. And, you know, apparently when you live in Connecticut, you have to sign some contract that says you're going to lose power, you know, at least 10 times a winter uh, for days on end. It's just really? all the utilities are above ground. And so a power outage for, for five or six or seven days was just a standard practice. And so if you had the wherewithal, you'd buy a generator. And, and you know, uh, so that's that's not really a hardship, but if you multiply that by six or seven or eight or nine or 10 weeks and they shut down the East or West or Texas power grids, uh, what happens? Well, you, you lose power. Suddenly things start to shut down. You don't get food you know, delivered to uh, the stores because transportation is shut down because now you're not moving fuel around. Uh, you can't get cash out. You know, there's, there's no cash in your, in your, in your ATM. Uh, and there's a, a your pharmaceuticals, your medicines. So that, you know, that's, that's a real problem. And our power grid, as an example, for infrastructure was never designed or built to withstand a terrorist attack or certainly a cyber attack. But, you know, so when, when the, the current administration, when the Biden administration talks about dumping money into infrastructure, hell yeah, I'm all about, you know, if that means, if that means improving our, 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 actual infrastructure, our, our power grids, our, our water treatment facilities, all the things that, that we really do rely on, that's infrastructure. If you put the money into that and your roads and bridges, right? Great, right? But let's not do what we always do, which is kind of lose sight of the important shit because we want to make everybody happy by talking about the feel good stuff, right? And let's focus on what we really need to focus on from a security perspective first, shore all that up. And, you know, maybe we have a couple of dollars left over by the time we spend all that money to uh do other things i don't know what that's why i'm not in charge that's why i'm not in charge yeah right. so who, who concerns you more china or russia or maybe they concern you in a different way yeah they concern they, they concern you in a different way yeah that's that's you can't Again, it kind of goes to what we were talking about a little bit before in terms of multitasking. You know, we and you know the military, the intel community, the staff are the really smart, sharp uh, individuals. Everybody knows that we can multitask in that regard. Uh, oftentimes, when I say we can't, I'm referring to politicians. Uh, but uh, China has far more resource than Russia does. Russia's got 
you know, basically the equivalent of maybe the fifth largest GDP in, in, in the EU. Um, and when oil heads south, right, uh, in terms of pricing, they're really sucking wind. And that's typically when you see Putin getting a little bit more aggressive, looking for some sort of external, you know, enemy or target to get the people focused on. Uh, which is another reason why we should be energy independent, because every time we're not, every time we say we're going to do something like shut down the Keystone Pipeline and we're going to focus only on green energy, guess what? Well, just like people are seeing right now, your, your price of gas goes up. And when the price of gas goes up, that, you know, without a doubt, benefits Putin. So if you're, you know, if, if you're in favor of, of, uh, of, of helping out Putin, great, you know, let's not be energy independent. But anyway, so that those two those two nations, their threats are somewhat different. They all want the same thing, which is to push us off the top of the food heap and ascend. Uh, it's just that China has, you know, far more resource than Russia does. Who who's third, by the way? If you if you were to say China and Russia, let's just say they're at the top. Who's third? Who's fourth? Who do you look at as a third? Is Turkey third? Is uh... you mean in terms of? Uh, Threat, like who would be threat. a threat oh, okay. that we need to, we need to yeah. Yeah. have our eyes on? Yeah, I mean, I think typically if you ask anybody uh, in, in Washington, uh, in the intel community, the military, they'll, they'll, they'll say it's China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, have, and they've occupied those top four spots. They, sometimes they rotate or, or switch positions, but that's been the case for, you know, two, three, four decades, or, you know, three decades maybe. So that doesn't change much. And then you've got up there in the top of the threats. You've also got, again, got this infrastructure issue. Um, and, you know, terrorism is, you know, in there somewhere, but not, you know, it, you know, even during the heyday of ISIS, was it up at the top as an existential threat? No. So it's, but it is, uh, it, it is remarkable how those threats have remained somewhat constant for a number of years now. So, so you, you, you heard, you know, the whole story about they were pulling out of Afghanistan and here's what we're doing. It's been a waste of time for 20 years because of 9-11. Why have we stayed there? And then, I mean, to, to hear Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton come out and be on the same page about the fact that, hey, this is going to be problematic if you do. You're going to face some backlash if you do this. Where do you stand with that? Yeah. Uh, well, look, we do operational missions we do tactical missions really really well you know this you're in the military and, and Tora Bora is a good example we do we we do things very very well from a tactical perspective we don't necessarily uh nation build in uh that part of the world very well at all uh because in part you know the the, the local buyers don't know what we're selling right and so my feeling has always been about Afghanistan is that, look, we we did a great job in Tora Bora. That was that was a that was a hell of an op. Right. Bin Laden got out, but that wasn't necessarily we weren't. That wasn't the priority target was getting them. It, it was taken down the Taliban. Now, we should have explained at that time. OK, if you do this again, meaning if you allow your country to be used as a training base, you know, to attack the West, whether it's us or our allies, we're going to come back in here and do this again because we do it very well. And so we'll come in here and, and kick your ass every time we need to. And that to me would have made more sense than trying to improve the literacy rate or, or try to sell them on some sort of pseudo federal democratic government concept in an environment where we know from recent history, from looking at the example of the Soviets occupying Afghanistan. The, we had the same exact problems that they had when they were trying to exit, right? They were trying to get it. They were trying to, okay, maybe we got to retreat to the urban centers. We can't hold the countryside. You know, how do we leave a, a government in place that, you know, will continue with our agenda once we're out? You know, the, all the problems that they were facing are the problems we are facing. We tended to mirror our values. We tended to think, well, you know, it'll be different because we're, it's America and it's, you know, democracy and it's freedom and, you know, they don't know. I, I don't know. So I think what we uh, we just need to be pragmatic. We need to understand that when we leave, the Taliban will take over again. They will take over again. Oh, yeah. The Taliban will be in charge. So once we leave, the Taliban will be in charge. And if we can't live with that, well, then, OK, then we, we shouldn't leave. But I guess my point is we can't stay there forever. And is it 
time to have a, a, a hard assessment as to whether this is, you know, one of our key priorities from a national security perspective. So I just, uh, I'm not one of those people that says we need to leave, you know, five or 10,000 troops there. Um, I think we just, at this stage of the game, um, Crazy question. As long, for you. as long as we can accept the fact that the Taliban is going to be back in charge. Crazy question for you. Do you think yeah. China wants us to leave? China wants us to be bogged down. China wants us to, to devote resources in there, just like Russia does. Russia was tickled pink when we started, you know, in there and because they knew, I think, what was going to happen. And so China, if it, if it causes us heartburn, if it causes us to, to expend resources, if it damages our brand worldwide, then China's all in favor of it. I don't think they necessarily want us to leave uh, because then they'll come rushing in and fill a vacuum. Um, I don't think anybody, at least in the rest of our lifetime, is going to look at the Soviet experience and our experience and think to themselves, you know, maybe we can do it next time better. <laughs> my, so, my concern is I, I think China may be sitting there saying, look, America, why don't you waste your resources to stay in Afghanistan? Because as long as you're there, the Taliban is not going to be waking up because if they do and they find out what we're doing to Muslims here in China, they may come after us before they come after you. At least you're not going out there, you know, doing to Muslims what we're doing out here. You know the story about what China is yeah, doing yeah. to Muslims. Over well, the, the difference they've got is that the, the regime, the China regime doesn't have to respond to anybody. They don't care. Right. And they understand that. I think they look, they they get that. They, they've what, already what essentially gotten, gotten, they've, they've gotten, they've gotten away with what they've been doing to the Uyghurs. You know, we've, we've what, gotten upset. We've, we, we've issued some memos. But in reality, we haven't done shit about what China is doing to the Uyghurs. And so if they have to deal with an insurgency or if, if, if the Taliban or, or elements of, of jihadism turns their attention to China, Chinese are going to respond in a, in a very brutal way. And they're not going to care what the world thinks about that. So you, so you don't think China cares about what the Taliban are going to do to them? I think they're prepared to deal with it in a way that we're not. And how would they deal with it? I mean, if you were to use your creative imagination, how would they deal with it? Well, I mean, I think there would, be, there would not be concern over, over casualties. Um, there would not be, you know, sort of that, that concern over how this looks to the world. Um, they, again, it's not, that's not their calculation. Right? If it's in their best interest, they'll deal with it and they'll, you know, clean up whatever mess is left afterwards. But they're not going to sit around and wring their hands and have, you know, remorse over it because the world thinks less of them. You know, so. Yeah, but I, I'm and, curious to know what they would do. Like, would you would you see them saying, OK, let us attack you directly. Here's what we're going to do to you. Uh, uh, how would they go about, you know, responding to the Taliban. That's what I'm curious about. Because well, it, would depend, it would depend on what that would look like, right? I mean, it's, it's, the Taliban's not going to, uh, what are they going to do? They're not, <laughs> they're not mounting an invasion. Um, so, you know, it would be, what is it? Is it, is it uh, you know, efforts to uh, engage in terrorist activity on, on uh, you know, within China? Sure, could be. And if that's the case, and that's, you know, I suspect that would be where it would, would lie. Then, like I said, the, the Chinese would 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 uh, my my feeling is the regime would would not agonize over a brutal response, and that would not mean that they're going to invade you know Afghanistan um, because again they don't view that in their own best interest. I so I don't know. It's all speculation. I'm just saying that that uh, from our perspective, uh, we've been in Afghanistan a long time. They're not picking up what putting down. You know, it's, it's a bit like Libya. Do you think we, we're going to create some sort of pseudo democratic stronghold in Libya? So, you know, I think it's time to assess in a much more um, direct manner what's in our best national security interests. I think we can maintain sufficient insight into what's going on within Afghanistan without having a large troop presence there. And I think that would then allow us to uh, drop back in if we need to, and again, in a tactical sense. Uh, so, but I, to, to think that somehow the Taliban will be part of a peacemaking deal and share government uh, uh, once we're gone is, is ridiculous. Well, it's crazy. I had Noam Chomsky on yesterday, and I'm sure you know who Noam Chomsky is. I'm, yeah. you know, we, we probably don't agree with a lot of things he says, but there's one thing that he did say is he said something that made me think in his book, Who Rules the World? Okay. Yeah. 
So in the book, he talks about how America was so fascinated with the, in the hunt of bin Laden, right? This was a 20 year hunt. Let's go find this bin Laden guy, right? 15 years, whatever the time, like 15 years, right? We're going to go catch him. We're going to get him. And he says, bin Laden won the war. And there's, what do you mean bin Laden won? He says, because America spent 3.2 to $4 trillion to kill one man. Mm-hmm. So if Bin Laden's vision was to help bankrupt America or get him to spend more of their money, guess what? He won. You mean yeah. to tell me one person's life is worth $3.2 trillion? So it kind of makes me think on what you're saying is, you know, uh, America seems to be the country that wants to get in the business of everybody's war, fight breaks. Hey, guys, 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 listen, I'm here. You guys don't need to fight. You know, hey, 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 hey. Like we're right. trying to be that. But, but sometimes when you do that, some people want to fight. Some people want to have differences. Some people want to have their disputes scored away and you're not allowing them to do it. Then you become the enemy because essentially two people turn against you and they're like, wait, uh, oh, get out of our business. You know, why are you mining so much of our business? I think sometimes America does that. But the Taliban, I think that like what you said, you said is Amer- it's not about whether we should get out or not. It's about if you do, the Taliban is going to come up. If they do take over the location, are you okay with the repercussions of what could happen? What are the potential repercussions? Could a potential another 9-11 happen? If another 9-11 happens, are we prepared to prevent it from happening? Do we have the right controls in place? How much is that worth? Have we spent time in infrastructure in that? I don't know. But Mm -hmm. uh, then the question becomes, are we ready for that? If that does take place, can another 9-11 happen with the way we're set up today? Uh, well, well, sure. Uh, you know, they, you know, there's always some element of a terrorist group out there trying to come up with a new scenario that will beat the defenses that you've currently got in place. We have gotten better at at not being reactive, right? Remember when truck bombs were the rage, and so suddenly the answer was bollards. You know, we'll put up lots of <laughs> perimeter bollards outside of government buildings and embassies, and that'll sort the problem out. Uh, And that was reacting to the threat that had already occurred rather than thinking what else could happen. We've gotten better at gaming out what else could happen. And so it's 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 a different time. Um, But, you know, the the problem is you can't, you know, you know, you you lose if you just let one get by. Right. You know, always, you you know, just just one just one slip and you kind of lost that effort. You know, you got to be right all the time in counterterrorism. So it's. It, it is a it's a it's a tough uh, it, it's it's it, it's a good question. I just happen to think that we've got the ability when it comes to Afghanistan to obtain sufficient intel and understanding as to what's going on without maintaining five to ten or fifteen thousand troops in country indefinitely. Um, because at that point, you're not doing really anything. You're just you're afraid to leave. Uh, you're afraid to build up. Um, and, and it's, I'm not quite sure who benefits from a situation like that. Um, but it's, you know, it's hard to imagine that it's been, it's been that long that we've been there. 3.2 to $4 trillion. That's yeah. a lot of money. And he's right. That's what, you know, Bin Laden talked about that, you know, rather famously. And, and yeah. he was very open about it. You know, he, he is, is part of his war against America was uh, on the economic front. And so, you know, uh, the, you tell you know, me the, whose life in the history of the world, you know, garnered the tensions of four trillion dollars of one country's, uh, you know, resources. That's 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 impact right there. You know? Yeah. No, it was. And it's and it, it kind of, you know, was it important to uh, to, to, to bag him? Well, yes. Um, did it become an outsized uh, focus. You can't underestimate the importance of it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, uh, you know, he was, you know, he succeeded in that regard, right. In terms of the, from the financial cost of his actions to the U S. So I never understood why we killed the guy. I mean, you go to his place, no one's there. He's by himself. Why do you kill him? Why don't you get him? And if we spend all this money, let's try to get intel out of them. Let's bring them back and see what we can do with them. I mean, we brought, how much did we learn from what Saddam did? Remember when Saddam was going to court and defending himself and everybody could kind of see how he's selling himself and 
trying to win the the citizens of Iraq over. And some people are saying he's full of shit. I don't believe anything he's saying. But some people are like, well, I kind of understand. Look at the man, sympathize with him. But no matter what, we got smarter as a as a mm-hmm. world to know what the guy's mode. I just didn't understand why we have to take him out. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in the moment, um, if you're faced with someone who's got a weapon and they appear ready to shoot, you're going to, you know, you know, you're not going to hear all sorts of things about, well, you know, whether it's uh, law enforcement, well, they should fire a warning shot or they should aim for the leg or something. Think, <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, you have never been in a gunfight. I, I agree. I'm and, not, I'm not, I'm not so, judging. I'm not doing that. I'm yeah, just saying. But, but I mean, I think it's, and, and then it's also, um, you know, just from an operational perspective, I suspect bin Laden actually by that point in his time, he had very little in his head of, of interest, you know, so I, I don't know what it would have accomplished. It would have been a, a, a real dog and pony show of a, of a, of a trial. And, you know, there would have been some people saying he needs to be properly tried and, and, you know, and so look, the guy, the guy got what he deserved. Um, there is no doubt that it, it, it at, at enormous cost. Um, but, you know, I think now to, to your point, we just have to, think, okay, well, what, what do we do if there's a next event like that, of that magnitude? And are we prepared for it? Do we respond properly? Um, you know, my, my speculation is yes, we would. Look, this country reacts very well at times to diversity, even now when we all seem to be very divided. Um, an outside event, you know, uh, the U.S. seems to come together at times like it never ever does in other you know, times. So hope you're right. Hope you go in that direction. By the way, are we still, would you still put us as the best uh, intelligence agency in the world? I mean, I know historically it's been the top three CIA, you know, Mossad and you got uh, MI6 and now you got the, the, the Chinese uh, intelligence agency, uh, you know, what do they call it? The ministry of uh, state uh, security of China, Mm -hmm. you know, who who do you think has got the most well-trained, prepared anticipation type of a group of people that are ready for anything to happen? We do. Yeah, the CIA. Uh, hey, look, hey, hey, you saw the ad. We started out the show with the ad. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not to, not to you know, denigrate the ad. But anyway, uh, but yeah, no, the, the agency, and I'm subjective. It's exactly what people would expect me to say. But uh you know, the, the CIA, in my opinion, anyway, is still at the at the top of the heap there. Um, you know, it's not that not to say the Chinese don't throw an enormous amount of resource at their intel operations. They do. And they've also got certain advantages in the sense that they've got they lock down their domestic you know, population like no other. Right. And they can get those people to work on their behalf um, and to. So it's you know, they've got it's, it's like the old Russian days during the uh, KGB days, you know. Everybody out on the street, every Russian out on the street was, you know, co-opted a sense to be a surveillant in a way for, you know, the KGB because they had no other choice. Um, but, yeah, the CIA is, in terms of resource capabilities, personnel uh, reach is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is at the top of the heap. I don't know. Uh I, you can buy it. I, 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 I can, you know, I, what do you more mean? power to you being diplomatic and your your commercial for your peers to see and say, Mike's on our side. You know, that's yeah. great. But, but I, you know what's crazy? You know how I think about it? I ask this from everybody. I ask uh, Shabbat. He's like, oh, it's this. I ask uh, uh, Woolsey, even for the two years he was in, I think he was in under Clinton. Yeah. yeah. You know, oh, it's CIA. And I, I'll ask different folks. But I think it's not MI6. I don't think it's CIA. I don't think it's uh, Mossad. I think it's China right now. Because, you know, and, and, and here's what I mean by China. Look, who is right now doing the job of espionage better than anybody else? I mean, you, you think about what is espionage, right? Let me, how many people are bought today? I don't know. You had World Health Organization being more aligned with China. You got political people in office that you have lineage to China, you know, and China is willing to spend the kind of money to buy people up in different ways. And we'll give you this seed. And there's so many creative ways. Oh, your kid needs something. Don't worry about it. Oh, your this person needs this. Don't worry. You need to go into uh, Harvard. Let us buy a building in Harvard for hundred million dollars. They owe us a bunch of buildings. So bunch of favors. So I don't know if anybody's doing a better job 
it's it's almost this is this is almost how I see it. You go to a club, you see girls, and you see the one guy that's extremely uh, uh, you know good looking. So it's kind of like uh, so the girls are attracted to him because of his looks. You're like, okay, that's MI6, good looking group, you know. Then you got uh, uh, you know uh, one that maybe they're known for being great and bad. And so you have to know his reputation. That's Mossad, let's just say. You know, oh, you, you know, this guy's going to... Like that should be the agency. <laughs> what okay. the hell? What are, gonna, what are we good at board games? What the, what, what, what are you, you going to get around to the agency? Then you got, wow, look at this guy here. Man, you know, he's, he's so good with words and, you know, great, uh, uh, very proud and, you know, the kind of person I want to bring to my family and introduce him. Say that CIA, right, U.S. But then there's the one that just says, look, I have one intention with you. I want to take you home tonight. And that's it. That's China. They're shameless. Mm. China is so shameless with their game where all the other a- agencies are almost a little bit more, you know, uh, careful in their ways of doing things a little bit more, you know, where they're just kind of like, no, we are dark and this is what mm. our intentions are. And we're going to take care of you and we're shameless about it. And I swear to God, if you screw with us, your life is going to be hell because we know yeah. your daughter, your this, this, that. I visualize them being that way again i may yeah. be wrong yeah, i'm yeah. just a regular guy here but uh i think quietly everybody's talking about mi6 Mossad, and cia i think china's like you guys can go get all the recognition on all the websites on who you are but i think we're kicking all your asses combined yeah. together well i mean there's no doubt that i mean there's nobody's underestimating uh chinese intel by any means any, anybody who's in the game by the way, it's good just to know that the CIA now we're known for our, you know, sweet personality. <laughs> um, hey, what the hell? Yeah, we're the ones who hey, you want to you take disagree? home to mom. Do you, you want disagree? to take a spy home to mom? You take an agency officer. <laughs> Do you disagree? Do you disagree that we're not the sweetest? Like, look at the ad we yeah. just made. We no, are so I know, I know, but opinion. I mean, but that's not that's that you know that's a that's a public facing side of it. I've seen I've seen again. I've worked behind the curtain. And, you know, we don't, uh, <laughs> we, you know, the job gets done, you know, when it needs to. Uh, but I think nobody's underestimating uh, Chinese intel for sure. Um, and part of it is, you know, uh, professional pride in terms of when you ask who's the best, obviously, you know. But I, I, I wouldn't expect you to say anything else. You, you ask any play, they ask Kobe, who's the greatest of all time? He says, I'm first. I yeah, wouldn't expect yeah. him to say anything else. But that's that's part of the debate. No, I'm right. I only ask because I think some are willing to get way more dirty than you guys are. Well, look, you face the Chinese Intel Service and the Russians uh, and a variety of others uh, don't face the same restrictions. And what I'm people saying. don't believe that. I mean, the, the, the sort of the, the progressive side, the, the far left, all those people who actually believe everything they see in a feature film or read in a beach book, you know, they won't believe it. But there's an enormous checks and balances placed on the agency, right? And it's a it's the most transparent, frankly, intel service in the world. So is that a detriment? Well, sure, it is. When you're talking about you know uh, operational um, effectiveness, maybe uh, because you have to you have to work within those checks and balances and those restrictions and the legalities that exist. The Chinese don't have to do that. So I take your point in that regard. But you know. Um, you know, with creativity and, and uh, you know, I, I don't know, I just, I, you can overcome that, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, I have to respect your experience and, and just tell you that you've seen things I haven't seen. And I hope you're right. I hope you're right. But your opponent can is, is willing to go to very, very ugly places that I think America is willing to, it's like, you know, you fight somebody, right? right? And you fight this guy, you're like, okay, there's a knife there. You're not ready to stab the guy, okay? You want to beat the hell out of him and just, yeah. you know, let's just say, but yeah, the, other okay, guy's willing, yeah. the other guy's willing to take the knife. You're not going to kick this guy's ass no matter how big you are. He's going to stab you, right? Yeah. So then you're like, I'm willing to stab the guy, but the other guy is willing to, you know, take out his gun. Okay, then like, I don't mind taking out my gun. Okay, but then the other guy's willing to go after your family. Oh, draw the line. I'm not going. But there is somebody yeah. that's willing to go to levels that you're not willing to go to. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, first of all, never, ne- never reach for a knife if you've already got a gun. So don't, don't, yeah, don't make that mistake. Uh, but no, it's, you know what, it is, and, and that is something that's used against us, right? By whether it's China or any other nation that doesn't have our best interest at heart. Uh, is our 
our openness, um, sort of our, our mentality, uh, our, you know, again, and, and, and people sometimes scoff, but, you know, our desire to do the right thing. Look, we engage in a lot of activities overseas as a nation for the right reason, because we, we genuinely sort of want to do the right thing. Do we make mistakes? Sure, we do. And, and then we try to course correct and all those things. But yeah, other nations, just like terrorist organizations, they use our openness and our freedoms against us, right? No, no secret there. Um, but, you know, I would much rather, having spent bulk of my life overseas, I would much rather live in an environment like this than, you know, whatever China's selling. I, I, I don't disagree. Don't, don't, don't take my messaging as that at all. I, I believe oh, no, America, no. Yeah. America is the greatest country in the world. That's not where I'm going. The, the place where I'm going is, look, things are getting darker. Hmm. And China's making it very clear that they don't care to negotiate on your terms. The only way they negotiate is on their terms. No American negotiate. The only person that's ever pushed these guys that's pissed them off is one guy. And it was the most hated guy in America in the history of America in a four year period to the point where anybody was willing to do anything for this guy to not get elected on the opposite side. And yeah. a person that got elected is probably the least qualified, uh, not qual maybe the not least qualified because his resume in the world of politics, 43 years, the least aspirational excitement. 20 people would show up to makes no sense. And I don't even think Kamala Harris did a, I don't know if she, maybe she did a press conference or two, but I don't, don't no. recall her doing anything there. No. So I, I, I don't know. When I think about that, I've interviewed mobsters, Sammy Double Gravano, you know, Michael Francis, all these different names that maybe you've heard about, Phil Leonetti from Philadelphia. Yeah. The mob system was what? Hey, you got a liquor store here, Joey? I do. Who's bothering you? Well, such and such. Moving forward, tell them I'm on you. You tell them Sammy's over here. Really? Yes. Guy comes to try to bully Joey. Hey, Joey, give me your money. I'm not giving you shit. Excuse, what'd you say? You want me to call Sammy? Oh, you, oh, you call Sammy? Yeah, no, 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 no. Listen, Joe, I got no problem with you. No. To me, again, I'm not saying that's the direction to go. Right. <laughs> but what I am saying is I almost expect, you know, the movie, uh, uh, what was the movie with uh, Tom Cruise where you can't handle the truth with. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, it was uh, yeah, uh, uh, up on the wall in Guantanamo. Yeah, with yes, Jack a Wilson. few good men, right? Good where, men, yeah. where the guy said you can't handle the truth, right? Mm. and the movie he goes because of code red let's set aside code red forget about code red but i do think the job of cia or delta or navy seal team six or some of this what you guys have to do i do believe 99 percent of america cannot handle the truth i believe that yeah I, yeah, I no, they, yeah that. most most folks really don't want to know how the sausage is made you know it's just not something they want to get involved in and, and like you said at the very you know, beginning, it's not something they have time for, right? Everybody's worried about, rightly so, you know, taking care of their family, doing all those things. People want national security. They want to feel protected, you know? And so, you know, look, I guess all I would say is um, within the confines of, of, of how, uh, you know, we operate as a military and as intel community, um, I still maintain we are the best out there. We're the most effective, efficient group out there. Uh, that doesn't undermine the seriousness or the challenges from an organization like, you know, the Chinese ministry. So, um, but it does, uh, yeah, that, that does present problems, right? The, and, and I think the problem that we're facing right now is exactly what you said with Biden and Harris is, is, you know, are they up to the task? Are they up to the task of standing up against China and, and dealing with them uh, in a way that, you know, um, they'll take seriously? And I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I don't either. But, you know, yesterday when I'm uh, talking to Noam Chomsky, here's a guy that's been a professor at MIT for 60 plus years. Right, That's a long time. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, do you love America? He says, how do you love a country? You can't love a country. I love my kids. I love my family. But you can't love a country. What do you mean love a country? I said, I can say I love America. He says, I don't understand the concept of loving a country, right? I, I asked you the question at the beginning, is mm -hmm. one of the priorities to be a CIA agent to have the love of the country? You know, they say love of the game clause. Like, you know, Michael Jordan and his contract had something with the Bulls called the love of the game clause. Like, you can never let me stop me from playing a 
small little pickup game in New York. You can't stop me because it's the love yep. of the game clause in all of his contracts. It concerns me if the CIA agents that they get in today, some of them actually don't like the ideas America was founded on. That scares the hell out of me because that's where you're not uh, uh, protecting the values that uh, you value that America was founded on. You're willing to fight for the values that maybe your mom, your dad, a professor at UC Berkeley sold you on that you've been convinced that's the way to go. And other countries are a little bit more loyal to the values that that country sold them on. I hope I'm wrong. I hope our agents yeah. are more loyal to what America found, was founded on. But uh, again, who am I? I'm just the guy. Well, but I, th- I, but I think you're right. I think you're onto something. I think if you if all you do is hire for the individual and the show that you are hiring, you know, all the various elements of society out there um, and those people, you know, that you hire you know, aren't coming to the table because of, you know, love of the team, love of the, the values, love of the, the ideas, the ideals, then, yeah, then eventually you're going to have a problem because you're going to have a group of individuals. And look, I don't care. You could have a conference room full of, uh, uh, you know, of diversity and all you got is, you know, maybe you got a conference room with diverse idiots. You could have a homogenous conference room and you got a conference room full of homogenous idiots, right? It doesn't matter. You hire the smartest, the most competent, the most capable skill sets you've got And it doesn't matter what they look like. Right. And so that to me seems like it shouldn't be that hard to understand. Uh, But no, I I, I disagree with Noam. I I love America. I love the ideals. I love the ideas. I I love the values. And, you know, some people will say, well, you know, you you know, your ideas are wrong or whatever. I I don't care. Right. I, you know, I'm. I don't, see any, I don't see any contradiction in saying you love America and, and, and you want it to be as best as it can be. Uh, look, I, 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 don't, I, I don't care what anybody thinks or believes or looks like or, or wants to be, right? I don't need to celebrate your ideas. You don't need to celebrate mine. Just get on with it. Be a good, honest, decent person. Be kind to people uh, and be a productive member of society. But, you know, Get the fuck out of my wheelhouse, right? I don't, I, I don't need, you know, to. All I care about is the character and the, and the content of your, of your, you know, self as a human. I thought we were honestly there, and that's one of the few times I've been disappointed in, uh, in, in the recent past is when I realized that we weren't there anymore, and that we're back to focusing on, you know, slicing and dicing up the population and the, and the you know, people with. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to me, and I thought we were past it. We're on the same page. I, 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 again, I saw the commercial yesterday. I'm like, wait, w- what is this? Is this Walmart trying to say they're inclusive? No, no, it's not Walmart. That's CIA. Yeah, I thought it's a Walmart commercial. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. thought it was Walmart or an Amazon commercial that we hire everybody. Yeah. That's my background, all this stuff. Anyways, Mike, I've had a blast with you, having you on. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your insight. No, and, thank uh, you, man. I've really enjoyed it. I uh, hope I wasn't too long-winded. No, I, I, uh, if I didn't have an appointment here right now, I would have stayed with you long. I really enjoy talking to you to hear your point of view cool, on uh, how things are. And uh, I salute you for being a patriot and defending your country and standing up for what your country's values and principles are. Thank you, man. I appreciate that very much. And, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again somewhere down the road. I definitely, hopefully next time it'll be face to face. Take care, buddy. Thank cool. you. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So after watching this video, do you like China anymore? Do you trust them? Do you want to go there? Do you want to go maybe there for vacation? Do you want to be in business with them? I'm curious. Comment below if you enjoyed this interview. i got two other videos I want you to watch. One is with the chief disguise officer, Jonah Mendez. Her job as a CIA agent, I think 28 years, was to go out there and help you have a disguise where people cannot tell who you are, where you're kind of changing your look. And the other one is Nick McKinley, who was the modern-day Jack Ryan. If you've seen the movie Jack Ryan... It's based on his life. If you haven't seen it, click over here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.